Okay, we have here today another interesting integral. This one's from MIT 2013. This was problem seven. We have the integral of sine x times the square root of one plus tan squared x dx. Okay, so to get started, for my first step on this, I just want to notice that for one plus tan squared x, we can use the identity on this and write this as secant squared x. So let's just come over here and rewrite this. So we'll have our sine x and we'll rewrite this whole thing and we'll write this as secant squared x dx. But now because secant is squared inside the radical, I can essentially kind of cancel these, right? And so we can write this as sine x times secant x dx. But then here, if I just write secant x, if I write this as one over cosine x, then what we have here, then sine x over cosine x, this just gives me tan x. But now this here is just a common integral. We can do this by the formula and write this as natural log absolute value of secant x plus c, and that's it. Okay, now that was pretty quick and easy, and this solution does match the MIT solution, but there is one problem. What we did here is not quite exactly true. Looking at this case here where we have something squared inside the square root, in this case it's just secant x squared. Well, when we do this, actually the value of this is going to be absolute value of secant x. And so this answer here, it's going to be fine, as long as secant x is greater than zero. And in these cases, we can just drop the absolute value. But the trouble is in the case where secant of x is less than zero, which is gonna be the second and third quadrants, then this here actually becomes minus secant of x. So what I've done in the past is I've written my solution with a plus minus in front, just to cover these two cases where we're saying in some cases it's gonna be positive and in some cases it's gonna be negative. But in past videos, some people have pointed out that this is not really complete because even though it tells us it's positive and negative in some places, it doesn't tell us where. So it's sort of lacking something. Now, one alternative to the solution I got from looking at Wolfram Alpha, and let's just look at that right now. Okay, so here we have our solution from Wolfram Alpha. Now you see their solution is a little more complicated than what we have over here, but it does provide some extra information. And what you can do actually to get a solution like this, if we just go back to the problem point, this is where we ran into trouble with our square root of secant squared x. If we just take that and we just leave it, but then if we divide by just what we got over here, if we just divide by secant x here, but now this value here, it actually covers all cases really, because when, if we have the case when secant x is greater than zero, then this just becomes secant x over secant x. So that's just one, so then that's not changing anything. Or when secant x is less than zero, again, this is minus secant x, so this just becomes minus one. So by multiplying our solution by this thing, we're actually adding the plus minus, but we're adding it in the regions where it belongs when secant of x is greater than zero and secant of x is less than zero. It puts the plus and minus on it in the right cases. But now here I've written it as secant x in the denominator, but actually we can just take the reciprocal and bring it into the numerator and we can write it as cosine x squared secant squared x. So then this right here is exactly what they have in the Wolfram Alpha solution, just multiplied by our first solution. Okay, so there you have it. Pretty standard problem that I've kind of overcomplicated in the end. Let me know what you prefer. Do you just think we should just stick with the simple MIT solution? Or should we go to the Wolfram Alpha solution? Or should we pick the middle ground, what I did? Thanks everyone for watching today. Have a good day.